Well, good afternoon, everybody. I think, um, obviously, um, our guest speaker today is a rock star. I think this is a record attendance, both in, in person and online. Um, it's just wonderful, wonderful to see everybody. Uh, so thank you so very much for coming. Um, and as many of you know, if not all of you know, this is an opportunity for us to really celebrate our newly appointed and promoted professors and senior scientists. And it's just um, especially great to see so many of you here in person. Um, and it just reminds us um, of really the breadth and depth of what we do across the school. And I always enjoy um, coming to these Dean's Lectures and thank you all for joining us here today. You know, in the past few months, we've had lectures on micronutrients, uh, genetic mutations, and gender-based violence. Um, and today, we get to hear all about the power of basic science. It is a pleasure to introduce today's lecturer, Dr. Anthony Leung. Anthony is a molecular biologist who studies gene regulation. By unraveling the mysteries of basic science, Anthony is arming us with powerful new knowledge positioning us to better understand and address everything from breast cancer to neurodegeneration to COVID-19, as you'll hear about today. Now, if you ask Anthony how he got started in all of this, and um, he'll tell you that it all started when he was growing up in Hong Kong, uh, conducting chemistry experiments in middle school. And I think his, his uh, children are following in his path, maybe. <laughs> Um, he found that he was very, very good at being exact and very good at finding solutions to problems. And um, that all just lit a spark in him. And if you ever talk to Anthony about ribosomes or protein folds, then you know that spark is very, very much alive uh, today. Anthony completed his undergraduate work at the University of Oxford, earned his PhD from the University of Dundee, and received his postdoctoral training at MIT. He joined the Bloomberg faculty back in 2011, and today he's a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology with three joint appointments over in the School of Medicine. Over the past uh, 12 years, he has proven to be a brilliant scientist, a gifted inventor, and a much loved colleague and mentor. He's won many, many high profile accolades, including to name just a few, the inaugural Johns Hopkins Catalyst Award, the Research Scholar Award from the American Cancer Society, and the School Shikani El Hebri Prize for Discovery and Innovation. Now, as you all know, our mission here at the School of Public Health is to protect health and save lives millions at a time. And some of that work takes place at the tiniest of places down at the cellular level. And Anthony likes to compare research and his research to a tree with molecular biology existing down in the often unseen roots. Of course, we all know those roots are very, very powerful and important, and they are the foundation of new therapies and yes, healthier populations. To give you a sense of what Anthony is working on, he is known for leading his field in a new direction by focusing on the role of macro domains, a promising, promising antiviral drug target, particularly when it comes to alpha viruses and coronaviruses. He also conducts pioneering work in parbiology. Now, I can't explain parbiology. You will explain it to us, right? Okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> But you'll hear about how Anthony um, is creating a, a widely accessible range of tools to better study PAR, which we'll learn all about, um, which will accelerate basic science discovery and move us towards clinical translation. Now, this, is, this of course, is just a snapshot of what Anthony does. And all of this sounds quite technical, but one of the things that makes Anthony so terrific is that he's a wonderful collaborator. He has created partnerships across the university and the school and beyond. He's joined forces with chemists, with oncologists, and with drug developers. And in fact, we are happy to have some of Anthony's commercial partners here with us on Zoom. They are joining us from Deerfield, an investment firm that is funding a collaboration project 
with Anthony's lab that addresses emerging viral pathogens of pandemic proportions. We're so glad that uh, we have them uh, joining us here today. Now, when I think back, um, one of the first times I got to know Anthony was when I read a story about his bringing breast cancer survivors into his, into his lab and getting his, the breast cancer survivors together with students and giving them a chance to learn from each other and to nurture their hope and their motivation together. Now, Anthony is also an exceptional teacher and mentor. He is passionate about recruiting students from underrepresented groups to his laboratory. He is involved in graduate programs across the university and is and a preceptor to many, um, on many training grants. He is also uh, the director of postdoctoral training for his department and provides invaluable support to fellows through, guidance, through his guidance and his kindness. Um, and I'm told he takes them out on lots of different outings. Um, so if you like ice skating, tubing, or bowling, you might want to think about joining his lab. But I think you have to know something about par biology to join the lab. Um, but if you do, um, sounds like a great lab to be a good thing. There you go. <laughs> Anthony will tell you that one of his uh, the, the best parts, his most favorite part of his work, is sharing ideas back and forth with his students. He compares it to playing ping pong. And for Anthony, that energy and collaboration is what science is all about. We are so, so very grateful to have Anthony here at the school and being such a bright light uh, here at Bloomberg. He is working with molecules every day and thinking about how they can impact millions of, li millions of lives at a time while inspiring others to do the same. Now, before I um, invite Anthony to come up to the podium to address us, I do want to welcome his family um, that have joined us here today. Um, his wife, Tun Hun, and their five children, although only three of them are with us here in the auditorium. The, and let me make sure I get this right. The oldest is taking care of the youngest because the youngest fell asleep in a car and we, can't, we couldn't just leave the youngest alone. Um, but uh, they'll all be joining us um, at the reception uh, at the end of um, Anthony's talk. So without further ado, Professor Leung. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean McKenzie, for the very kind introduction. And I'm honored to present this lecture uh, sharing my intellectual journey at our school. Our school mission is protecting health, saving lives, millions at a time. As explained by my former chair, Pierre Colum, um, when uh, recruit me here at that moment, he said that we are into scientific investigation that needs to not only to treatment, but also prevention. Today, I'm going to tell you two stories of discoveries that may help to preempt the pandemic and find new strategies to prevent neurodegeneration. As aptly put by our chair, Ashi, recently, we are into molecules that impact millions. And the focus of my lab is linked to a molecule related to vitamin B, characterized by our founding chair, E.V. McCollum, and called NAD. NAD is a molecule essential for life. And if you are studying biochemistry or you are studying MCAT for medical biology, you will remember there is a complex level of metabolic pathway. And NAD do play an important role to change the oxidative status, to turn our food into energy. But then this molecule also has another role, is to regulate gene expression. And what it does is that it takes part of it, of the uh, ATP ribose. Let me see if I can do this. So part of this molecule called ATP ribose, it can covalently conjugate to protein. And this is called ADP ribosylation. If you have multiple units of ADP ribose, it will be called poly-ADP ribose. As the <laughs> McKenzie asked, this is PA. <laughs> and you may have heard about the enzyme that regulates uh, PA biology. It's called PAPS. Because 
PA inhibitor, the drug that stopped the PA function, has already recently approved for, by FDA to treat many types of cancer, including those with BRCA mutation. So, but what I'm going to tell you today is that the PA biology is not just restricted to cancer biology. It also has implication in virus infection and neurodegeneration. So for us to know more about the function of ADP riboxylation, I always think about that. It could be like turning a person into a superhero. How can you add a chemical to a protein? How they change the function, just like putting a cape onto a superhero. So to understand the function, you would want to know where the cape join, that is where the ADP ribos attach to the protein, one of the 20 amino acids that the basic units of the protein. At the same time, we want to find out like what is the structure, like the, what is the cape look like. And through these two analysis, as I will tell you, one by looking in the site's conjugation, it leads us to a new viral, ta uh, anti -viral target that will help us to prepare pandemic, not just now in the COVID, but for the future. And the other is that knowing about the structure, it helps us to lead to a new insight in neurodegeneration. And my lab is into this new concept, new biology, but we also like to develop tools because this is uh, rightly pointed out by, by, uh, by physicists, Freeman Dyson, say that if we uh, go for tools, different revelation is that we will find new things that need to be explained. And that's what exactly what happened when we go to PA. When we develop new tools, we find something new that we need to figure out what is the biology behind. And this generates a lot of new direction. The first tools that develop that's in our lab is because although there is a lot of biology of PA ADP riboxylation in cancer, virus infection, neurodegeneration, but we, since the discovery of this modification in 1963, that is about 60 years ago, there were no, when I start the lab in 2011, there's no way to find in the potium Y manner where the ADP ribose is conjugated to protein. But if you think about like how the protein function, how you suddenly endow in the new function, you really want to know so that you can get into the mechanistic details. And there are a few reasons why it cannot be done. There are some existing challenge. One of them, if we want to use a technology called mass spectrometry, basically they look into the mass of the molecule, how much it has been changed. It is very difficult for this modification because as I mentioned earlier, it not only adds one ADP ribose, it can add two, three, and up to hundreds of it. If we put into a machine analyzing mass, it will be a wide range. We don't know what we are looking about. And then second is that this bond here, some of them is quite labor. So we need a uh, method to preserve it. Finally, that uh, as you can imagine, this molecule is essential for life. If it takes part of it to conjugate to protein, it will take up a lot of energy. So only a very low level of modification is present. So you need a way to enrich it. And then lastly, out of the 20 amino acids, the building block of protein, 11 of them were known by studying single individual protein can be conjugated with ADP ribose. So you want a non-biased way to identify the site of the modification. So when I start the lab, I'm fortunate that I have friends that uh, collaborate since we were PhD students, that uh, he also started a lab in University of Washington, Shawan Ang. That's uh, together with my first student, uh, Casey here, uh, that uh, we developed the first technique. What we have done is that we thinking about uh, old technology back in 1970s, that they tried to cut up the poly ADP ribose individual parts, and they were cut between the two phosphate groups here. So that you can identify the length and what kind of structure that it made. So when I was reading those old literature, then I was thinking, maybe we can use it, turn it into a proteomics tool. What you need is that you have the enzyme to go into complete reaction. Then it will left behind with the phosphoribose group on the protein. That is taking an uh, analogy like a whole tree 
it's very difficult to find out like where it conjugates. But you use an X to chop it, so it leaves with a stump. And this provides a unique mass signature, uh, 212 deltons, for us to identify where is it conjugated on the amino acid. And since then, we have developed many uh, similar enzymes that we discover, including Lutex uh, enzyme, that help us to identify the sites of modification. So it takes us three years to like, uh, look into this. Particular, we are very extracted by leaving the phosphate group behind. Because phosphate attaching to the protein, this is called phosphorylation, has been studied widely in biology. And there are a lot of proteomics tools to do. So we try to tap into the existing resources on proteomics, enrich them so that we can identify the modification. So what we did is that we get an in vitro part modified and then put into the cell lysate, use the enrichment method. We can identify not only in the glutamate sites here, but on many other sites as well. So we were very excited with uh, Casey, and then we kind of like submit our pa first paper of the lab. But then as soon as I hit the submit button, I told Casey that, well, <laughs> the first question that the reviewer will ask, great, you have a technique that works in test tube. Can you show me even one single site in cells? So, so immediately that we need to think about how we can get from the cells. So, so we think that, okay, let's go through the same pipeline in the cell lysate. Uh, hopefully it will work. On the other hand, I told Casey, why don't we try a protein domain? It's called Marco domain, known from Archibacteria. That has very high affinity, up to, uh, down to nanomolar affinity. That can kind of enrich the ADP ribosylate protein. In this case, it's a simple mixture in the test tube. Then it should be go for us to find out the site of the modification. And both methods work, but also reveal an unexpected biology for us. So at that time, we were searching where the ADP ribose come in on the, uh, on the aspartate, glutamate, lysine, and arginine. And you can see here are uh, two bar graphs. One is the unenriched, just we use the method straight on the cell lysate. The other is we use the macro domain to enrich it. And then we see that there is a great difference here. Whenever there is the macro domain enriched fraction, we see much less of the glutamate residue for whatever reason. So we had two hypotheses at that time. Either somehow the macro domain has a selectivity against protein that is conjugated to the glutamate site, or there is an enzymatic activity that break down the ADP ribose when they conjugate to the acidic residues. So, so it, this, the latter hypothesis turned out to be correct because around the same time, there is paper, there are two papers published about, and they look into macro domain from human to bacteria to yeast, fungi, and they found that there are two class. One class, they can just bind ADP ribose. And then the other class, like the human macro D2, and then our Archibacteria AF1521, and also a yeast uh, macro domain, they all have a uh, activity to remove ADP ribose. So, so then this leads us to think about that. Macro domain is the enzyme that opposing PARP biology. PARP is to add the modification. Some of the macro domain is to remove it. So, but then when we look into this, like uh, the sequence of all this protein, the bottom parts here, they are those that only bind ADP ribose. The top, they can not only bind to ADP ribose, they also have enzymatic activity. So when we look into the amino acid sequence, this building block, they give us a distinct signature that is on the top part. And I was catching my eyes of the SARS-CoV that was there. And this is because I'm from Hong Kong, as mentioned by Dean. This is what I remember about Hong Kong for my first 19 years. The, the beautiful place, I breathed there, I lived there, and go to bookstore there. But 2005 was a changing point, that the whole city stopped, and everyone is on mass. People don't even want to touch the public space. And I know now it's a family idea for, for everyone of us. But back in like uh, 2015, that's how I triggered my mind. So I decided like, 
okay, I have been studying molecular biology all my life. Let's do something like, can I think of something on this macro domain, on the virus, to investigate about it? So when we look into the viral macro domain, it turns out that it's present in a lot of human disease causing viruses. And including two major class that is now classified by NIH that has um, pandemic risk out of eight of them. So one of them that everyone here know, coronavirus. And not only SARS, MERS, but also SARS-CoV-2. In fact, all seven human coronavirus contain that, this macro domain. And then in addition, there are hundreds of coronavirus circulating in the animal vesicle. They all contain macro domain. So that's one of the worry is that could they jump from the animal vesicle to a human again and causing havoc to our life. The other class is lesser known, just like coronavirus before it's famous, it's called tocavirus. And this virus is mosquito borne and is carrying America and also around the world. And they are increasing spreading because of globalization and also global warming. And some of them you may heard about it, called chikungunya viruses, Mayaro virus, and some of the acephalitis virus. This was caused um, bring information. And it's uh, people uh, in, in CDC has been convincing that this is a bioweapon type of viruses. So, but then um, there is a big problem is that just like coronavirus before it become famous, there's no drug to treat, no vaccine to prevent. So then I was thinking, okay, let's study about the macro domain. Among these two virus, I picked Togo virus for a couple of reasons. One is that it is a much simpler virus, smaller one, only have 11 genes. So we can uh, take care of it and then just like manipulate, it's much easier. The other reason is because of Diane uh, from the MMI, Molecular uh, Microbiology and Immunology Department. Diane is the um, leading authority on Togo virus. So, so we partner together and I'm going to tell you a short story that later lead into the drug discovery project. And then uh, we are fortunate that I was funded, uh, sponsored by the Catalyst Award that sparked the research, and later by the Fisher Center that also provided pilot grants to discover the biology. And, and while doing this, all this, then of course you want to talk to the NIH, NIH program officer and say, which virus should I pick? And then, and then she would tell me, why don't you try uh, chikungunya? Because at around 2013, there was a big issue in, in, uh, in Americas, and it may be spreading to US as well. So, so this is uh, uh, a virus that found in, discovered in 1952 in um, Tanzania. And then the chikungunya, the word means in African word, it means that bends in pain. Because this virus, although it will not kill you, but it will cause you severe joint pain that can last for months and even years. And definitely that would be a huge public health burden about it. And this virus can be carried by mosquito that spread half of the world population. And that is shown by the color heat map here, including where we stayed here in Maryland. And we are all naive population. If this or other similar virus come, we don't have drug or vaccine to take care of it. So, so then we just go ahead to do some biochemistry because we are the biochemistry department. We look into the sequence and then we see that the exact same signature as the other virus, like the closest homologue, the human macro D2, like the SARS COVID and also the AF1521, the macro domain that have the enzymatic activity. So Lyle in my lab uh, purified all this protein and then also to test the enzymatic activity. What we did is that we use a protein, the uh, PARP, one of the PARP protein, and then we use a radioactive NAD, so that is radioactive, labeled it. And then we can incubate either buffer or the macro D2, the human macro D2, or the chicken gunia macro domain. And as you can see, the signal of the radioactive, once you put with this macro domain, then it's reduced. So to really confirm that this is really ADP ribose leaving it, what we have done is to take the liquid, use an analytical method called thin layer chromatography. Basically, it means a piece of tissue paper or something similar that you dot at the bottom and then see how far they spread. 
And for the ADP ribose, it has a distinct signature. So we can see that when you use either the Marco D2 or the chicken gunya Marco domain, you see the release of the ADP ribose. So in fact, that is the case that Marco domain can release ADP ribose from the conjugated protein. But then one thing that's really uh, stick into the eyes of Lyle, because he is very into all this biochemistry, he looked into like, even the incubates for a long, long time, there are always some signal left behind. So he was saying, why? <laughs> why it's not complete. So we're thinking that maybe there is some of the ADP ribose is conjugated to different class of amino acid. And Marco domain have a specificity to remove ADP ribose only in a subset class. And therefore we use our proteomics technique to answer that question. We look into the uh, part that is modified. We see that it's modified in the aspartate, glutapate, and the lysine residue in this case. And then when we put into the macro domain, all the signal on the aspartate and the glutamates go away, but not for the lysine. So this really revealed to us that although there is many amino acids, like 11 out of 20, that can be modified by ADP ribose, but virus only care about if you, they conjugate it to the aspartate and glutamate residues. So we want to understand what this enzymatic is important. So we particularly focus this kind of the same residues, it's called glycine, that is conserved is all of this. And people, uh, other groups previous had looked into the human macro detail, know that if you mutate it, then it will disrupt the activity. So what we have done here is a partnership with Diane's group, my lab focus on the biochemistry, and then Diane's group going to the virology. We look into creating all these mutants, and see how does this mutation affects the biochemical enzymatic activity. At the same time, we do the same mutation in the virus, changing the genetic code, and they see how they respond. So one mutation that we change is a glycine reactase mute to a glutamate residue. So in this case, we know from our biochemistry, it totally abrogates the enzymatic activity. So then we go, okay, let's uh, type in the sequence and then like change, like Richie, what they have done is like changing it so that it um, changed to a glutamate residue in the genetic code. But then what is surprising to us, we can make the RNA genome, put it back into cells and then we'll retrieve the virus. But every time we retrieve, it's reverted back to the original one. And this suggesting that this enzymatic activity is very critical for their survival. That's why they keep on selecting because we know that RNA virus can mutate all the time and they will just revert it back. And we have done multiple mutation, I think six of them, and six of them all do this, that they will revert to the wild type. So, but then it's good. It shows that it's really critical for the virus replication, but it's not useful if we want to understand what does this enzyme do in the uh, physiology. So what we did is that we just want to tone down the activity, like going to 75% by changing into an alanine residue or 50% to a serine residue. And then we use a mouse model. In this case, that we inject the virus on the mouse brain. So within two to four days, it will kill all the mice. But then if you use the uh, mutants that have enzymatic activity, 75 of the wild type, the original one, only half of the mice die. If you now further tone down to 50%, then only one out of 24 mice die. So this really suggesting that this is important also for the pathology. So when we see this data, then uh, we're very excited. And then also other groups like uh, Stan Perlman and then also Tony Fur groups also see similar phenotypes in coronavirus. So this leads us to think that, well, this may be a very good drug target. So I was very excited sharing in like this type of setting in the lecture. And then one student come up, a master student, uh, Jack Goodman say, anyone screening for drugs? I say, I really want to, but I don't have people. And I need to, I mean, I have some idea, but then he said that I can help because he's just have the summer internship in a pharmaceutical company focusing on develop high throughput assay. I said, great. <laughs> then we just partner together and particularly we think of Lyle's data. Because we know that when Marco domain 
reacts with the ATP riboxylated protein, it will release ATP ribose. And then maybe we can do an inhibitor screen to find out what can not release this ATP ribose. But there is a problem. There is no commercial technique to look into the ATP ribose. So, the, but then the good thing is that while we were developing the proteomics technique, we find a class of enzyme, the lutex hydrolase, which help is quite nice. You always can find an expert. In this case, Sandra Gabilli. That uh, we find that a, a, a type of uh, lutex is that it will only break down ATP ribose, but not when it is conjugated to protein. So then, when it's break down, it will release AMP. And there are existing commercial assay that can convert the AMP into a light signal so that we can measure it. So in this case, then we developed our first high throughput assay in free active four wells that uh, it gives a very good signal if you have the substrate with the macro domain and the nut F, the nutex enzyme. But it, with the nut F alone, it gives very low background. This high signal to oil ratio gives us excited. And therefore, we go on to like, look for a company to sponsor us. And then uh, we talk, talk, and then in this is one of the occasions. I just copy one of the slides that I, I put it here. And uh, on February 2019, I say, OK, this is the, the idea that we know that there is the virus macro domain in the chikungunya, in the SARS COVID. We know that this is. Uh, potential disease causing, pandemic potential, why don't we do it? But at the same time, we know the human macro domain, it can also cause cancer uh, problem. So maybe we can screen both and develop some compounds, then it will be good as a new class of drug because there is no company at that time looking into the macro domain as a new class of drugs. So I was very excited about it. So after the pitch to it, uh, I get some feedback. They say that your program is exciting, it's very solid, you have the as it seems to be working. But then the problem is that um, the antiviral is a very small market. So it is so although it's a Valentine's Day, I didn't get any love from it. <laughs> so, but as we know, like um, 2019 is a, a changing form for every one of us. Within a year of the Valentine's Day. Uh, I think all of us nearly stay at home. And, and that's kind of changed our, all our how, even how we come together, even in the lecture, all these things. And, and then we, we immediately switched here. And Jack, for example, all the lab was shut down except you're doing COVID work. So we switched everything to COVID work. And then at that time we say, well, we, we need more people. So I asked the lab, anyone volunteer, like brave enough that during COVID time, because everyone don't know where it come from, right? So, so how to spread. So Morgan is very brave that he raised his hand and then joined the team to, to work in the uh, pandemic time to look into this problem. And particular because in early 2020, the sequence already released. So we could quickly check the, all the key residue highlighted by the pink here, they are conserved. So I think that this is good that it could be a potential drug target. So again, as a biochemist, we go purify the protein and then use the same assay that I mentioned earlier, look into, into a pulp substrate and then look into how many ADP ribose is present. And either including in the buffer, you see that there's no change in signal, but over time, if you add the enzyme, the macro domain, the MAC1 macro domain from the SARS-CoV-2, then you see that it decreased the ADP ribose signal. So this saying that this could potentially doing the same. But if you think about like, oh, why we need another drug target. So here's what we have been targeting so far. The spike protein, that's our vaccine target, but this also can be a drug because we can develop the antibody, put it into intravenously, that it can help the patient. But at the same time, they're targeting the RNA polymerase, also the protease about it. So these are all good that they have uh, varying efficacy. But then if we think about the last pandemic, which is HIV, that's causing a lot of problem around the world. How we get around it is that we need to diversify our portfolio because it's not just one hit target. We can make a combo treatment and then also there would be drug resistant. So if we have multiple targets, that will help us. 
So we think that the MAC one could be our good job target. So that's what we target for. So, but then we were thinking like, okay, let's look into the sequence of like hundred thousands of sequence that is available at that time. So we want to look into like the ADP ribose catalytic site. Around it, there is within five amson, there is like very little mutation at all. So this is very important because like the other target, the spike protein, the polymerase, the protease, in the natural selection, they all have the variation, but not for this protein. So it seems like that this could be a very good drug target for us. So then we partner with uh, John, uh, John Hopkins Drug Discovery Team, made by Bob Slusher. Um, and then we just go on to screen a very small library. Uh, Jit is helping it as well here. Uh, 3,000 compound. And here's just some of the slip of the data. That I just highlight two compounds here. One compound that we know that it can inhibit from the SARS-CoV-2, the MERS uh, coronavirus, but also the human macro domain. So this would not be a good antiviral drug because it will also hurt the human. But then on the other hand, we do find some compound that is selective to the virus only. This gives us hope that there is chemical space for us to look into virus specific macro domain inhibitor. And then together with uh, Jürgen Bosch, who is our uh, structural biologist, we look into like the ADP ribose binding sites on it. And particularly what I'm showing you here is a charge map. Either the red or the blue, it means that they are uh, negative and positive charge respectively. So you can see the virus macro domain active site is highly charged. But then the human macro D2, which is the closest homolog, is very neutral. So there is some chemical distinctiveness that may allow the selection about it. So to summarize this part of my talk, we think that macro domain is a good potential drug target because it is struggable, and then it's critical for the viral pathogenesis. It's conserved in all coronavirus. Uh, it's very different mechanistically distinct from existing <coughs> targets, and it has an invariant ADP ribose binding site. And perhaps that we can even extend beyond coronavirus for tocovirus as well. Then of course, it's that can we really make a drug? So for the next couple of minutes, I just want to share with you my path on like hoping to get into that stage. And as you can imagine, the road is bumpy. <laughs> it's not straightforward. And it all starts with uh, interest with Diane that we have a collaboration. The Catalyst Awards help us to start the project. And then we publish the discovery, start to develop the essay in 2070, and then continue to uh, discover the biology with the Fisher grants. And then we get into some type of competition, but then even we get into the final stage, we fail. That is really at the lowest point in this uh, um, uh, diagram here. But then the good thing, I mean, uh, during the uh, COVID time, we can pivot it. And then we uh, were supported by another internal grants that helped us to do the research discovery award. And then I keep on pitch, pitch, pitch to as many companies would like to listen while I'm staying at home <laughs> on Zoom. Like, hey, it's, it's very important, not only for this, because at that time people were saying that, well, it's too late to de start developing drugs. But I say that, well, this could be the next pandemic. But thank God there is a company, the Deerfield, through the Bluefield Innovation, that is partnered with Hopkins. They say that they have the vision that share with us that they want to address the problem for the emerging pathogen, not just for now, but also for the future. So, and I also want to, uh, I'm also grateful that Rachi, like declining many offers and come back to lead the team um, um, to, to run the virus project because he, she is the one who discovered the viral macro domain uh, and we all want to change our discovery into drug discovery. But then one of the biggest regrets that I have is not be able to convince people in 2019. Imagine in February, I was successful. We would have a much better head start. But as pandemic now calmed down a bit, we hope that is the case. We can go back to normal. We see each other in the lecture hall, which is very nice. I think it is actually now is the golden period to invest so that we can come out head start 
for the future. This sentiment is shared with my good friend Neil Poon, who discovered the SARS virus, the first one in 2003 in Hong Kong, and he recently shared a cartoon on Twitter. So this is what he showed, and the cartoon also says something as follows. Those who don't study history are doomed to repeat. Yet those who do study history are doomed to stare helplessly while everyone repeats it. And I don't want to be like that at all. We are scientists. We see patterns. 2003 SARS, 2012 MERS, 2019 COVID. It's just a matter of seven to nine years there will be another coronavirus lurking behind our corner. Or maybe a lesser known virus like Togo virus that due to climate change or urbanization that caused another type of havoc. Are we ready for it? Instead, I think while we're taking a repeat for this uh, pandemic, now is the time for invest the future. If we think about mRNA vaccine, it was not developed during the pandemic. It's years ahead before that. And now the, these companies literally reap their benefits by the investment. Now we have the opportunity to develop a total new class of drugs, not only for viral infection, it could be beyond, like the cancer that we talked about earlier. Therefore, I'm very grateful and also excited by the uh, partnership with Deerfield that we can turn our foundational discovery to uh, drug, uh, drug uh, therapies. As our school um, mission is to protect life millions at a time, I want to be part of it to stand ready when we are facing the emerging threat. So before I move on to the next section, talking about a totally different project, I just want to pause for a moment if you have questions that I can answer. Any questions? Okay, that's good. So if not, then yeah, question? Yeah, you may want to use the micro. So how how does you know uh mass uh inhibit the microprogression of the coronavirus? I mean like yeah. You mean the mechanism, how does uh macro domain work in terms of what type of substrate or what kind of mechanism? Is that what you're asking? How the in inhibition of the macro domains would treat to, you know, lead to the failure of... Uh, I see. Uh, I see. <laughs> so our idea about macro domain is always a um, uh, match between like the host, because when therefore there is virus infection, interferon will trigger. And a lot of pups are triggered by interferon. They will add a lot of ADP ribosylation. And then virus somehow think that this is not good, particularly on the acidic residue. They want to remove it. So they are kind of like a battleground, the ADP ribosylation. So that's the idea of what we are looking into at this moment. Okay, so let's move on to the next section. It's been much shorter. That's what uh, is about all about neurodegeneration, where a general feature that causing the disease is protein aggregation. However, what triggered them is still remain quite unclear. Today, I'm going to submit you to a notion that poly ADP ribose or PAR uh, play an important part of it. And all this again is starting with our two developments, aiming to understand how poly ADP ribose work. Taking back the analogy of the superhero, if we want to know how this um, ADP ribose, like a cake, how they work, we want to trace it, just like putting an air tag or a tracer to monitor where they go. So we are thinking that, can we do the same for poly ADP ribose? Can we add some functionality to it? So over the years, uh, we have team members like Yoshi and Mosan that we develop tools to label both ends of the poly ADP ribose. And we can add a fluorescent group, so like a light bulb, we can visualize it in the cells or under the microscope. Or we can add an enrichment handle called biotin so that we can pull it out and then see what kind of protein. 
And using this technology, we can develop new tools, proteomics tools, that we can look into the whole protein. What kind of protein bind to PAR? Because if we want to understand uh, the, how protein come together, this is one thing that we need to know. And then at the same time, instead of omics level, we can go down to single molecule to look into how protein interact with PAR. And this is made possible, again, with uh, Hopkins' discovery abroad, that it allows us to develop an interdisciplinary team. I'm focusing on the PAR biology, and then we have a nuclear exit, chemist, and also a single molecular biophysicist uh, to work together on uncovering this new biology about it. And we were surprised to find out that poly-ADP ribose play an important role to pull protein together especially protein implicated in neurodegenerative disease. And this is down to a very fundamental cell biology question. We know that cell is not just a bag of soup, like protein floating around. Instead, they are very organized. Some way that we organize would be uh, having a physical barrier called membrane uh, that's provided to protect your DNA together. And you can think of like you are making something, but you have a Ziploc bag that they protect things inside of it. But on the other hand, when we look under the microscope, there are a lot of structure that doesn't have any membrane or physical barrier to separate. And there are a phenomenon called biomolecular condensate, where protein come together and in a selective manner. And some of them is like present all the time, like the nucleus, some is specific, like in the neurons, some only in the specific stress condition, like during DNA damage or a stress condition. And we find that PA actually regulated three of them. And one of them, how I start my lab is, and also come to the whole PA field, is that I discovered poly-ADP ribose when I was at MIT with Phil Sharp and also Paul Chang. I discovered not only the polymer is there, the modified substrates are there, as well as the enzyme that regulates it. And the enzyme is important for the structural integrity in a structure called stress granule. And this structure is enriched with a lot of translation factor, but nobody knows the function of it at this point. Still people have a lot of speculation, but nobody knows what they do. But although this discovery is in 2011, but until like 10 years later, that we discovered that virus care about this structure. And they, how they care is that they have enveloped the enzyme like the macro domain. They remove the ADP ribose to break down this structure. So somehow that part in the stress granule is important for virus. There is a selective mechanism. Like amongst all these things, virus only care about like ADP ribosylation in this case. So then the question is, how does PAR cause protein to come together. So we want to go back to the drawing board to think about the chemistry of it. Because if you look into the PAR structure, it's similar to other nuclear acids, like RNA, that now is a common household name. And, and it has very similar constituents. You have the ribose, you have the phosphate group, it has the base here like the adenine. But then there's also some distinct differences. So if we think about how, because RNA has been known to like call protein to come together to form condensate. So we think that maybe PAR can do the same. But then to be like, to be a more non-biased manner to understand it, about it, we don't want to know what protein can bind to PAR. Although like over the years, thousands of protein has been identified to bind to RNA, only 92 protein binds to PAR. So we think that, like uh, Morgan, who had the project, think that that definitely would not be the case. So we, together with uh, uh, Mark Greenberg, a nuclear acid chemist in the Homewood campus, we developed uh, a chemical probe together with Morgan. And um, what we did is that we put the PAR and then add an enrichment handle. So you can think that it changed the PAR into a fission rod and then see what protein bind to it to capture those proteins that may be transient just binding, we put a photo cross linker group so that when you just shine the light on it, it will suddenly capture it, make it into a covalence bond that it will be tightly integrated together. And then we can use a lot of stringent reagent to wash it. 
And then we go to the proteomics level. We do a parallel experiment. One, we use our purple link, our probe. The other is a very similar, but without a photo cost linker. Then we shine the UV light, use a strap everything, uh, which bind to the biotin to pull down it, uh, wash it very stringently, and then go for the mass spectrometry. And here's the data. And we identify majority of the protein is on the right side. This is where the purple links, so the enrichment. And then we are very happy when we look into the 92 PAR binder that is known in the literature, all of them fall here, like 39 of them fall into here. So we are in the right track, uh, not only on the right side, but also on the right track. And then now we want to look into the candidates about it, because some, you always want to talk into new protein. Can we find some new protein? So we pick eight different candidates, purify them, and then see whether they bind to PAR. And eight out of eight um, turns out to be positive. So they all bind. So this means that we suddenly expand our protein for PAR binding from 92 to 700 protein. Then we want to find out like, so what do they do? So we do some analysis and then look into the amino acid composition. We see that they're enriched with prion-like domain and also called low complexity region. What it means is that these are repeated amino acid that is commonly found in uh, how protein come together, the condensate. So we also do a database search, just look into the nucleus, stress granule, DNA repair foci, they are all known by molecular condensate, and we see a very good statistical significance, but not for like a membrane-bound compartment, like uh, endoplasmic reticulum. So then the key question is, how does PA promote protein come together to condensate? So, we look back into our whole set of data, the 700 protein, we see a particular family called FUS, and also their parallel is kind of come together. This family is known to be important in neurodegeneration and also cancer. And they share a similar structure that they have some uh, prion-like domain, and then they also have some RNA binding domain. So we think that's good for us to characterize how protein promotes condensation particularly because this protein is also known to be enriched in the condensate that is regulated by PA. But one more important question, similar to the Dan case, is because there is expert in Hopkins, and that's Sua uh, Mion in the biophysics department. She has been studying first on how RNA can mediate them to come together. So we're thinking that we can develop all the tools on PA, just make making what RNA that she has been studying. Whatever tunes that she has, we can adapt it and change into a part tunes to studying the phenomenon. And this revealed quite a bit of a surprise that I would want to share with you. So here is, uh, so we comment a team together that this is the data. What I'm showing you on the left here is RNA. That is say the U20, 30, 40, 60. It means how many U residues on there. Um, and then because we know that first, the physiological concentration is one micromolar. So we use a uh, different concentration of the uh, RNA, like one micromolar, 100 nanomolar, 10 nanomolar, one nanomolar, to see whether they come together. If they come together, they form a condensate, just like a fluorescent dot here. So as you can see that uh, only one to one ratio, you can form this condensate. So the surprise came when we do on a path. There are three things that we want to highlight. First is that it is super potent. Not only you can use one micromolar of PA to cause condensate, you can lower tenfold, 100 nanomolar, hundredfold, 10 nanomolar, and even down to one nanomolar. So we are talking about the ratio is one PA molecule can cause thousands of molecules to come together. How could that be possible? Second is that there is link specificity. Only certain length above like the eight or more, they can form condensate. And finally, the last part is that we see that, that it not only causes the protein to condensate, if you increase the PAR length or concentration, which is quite common in neurodegenerative disease, they change from protein condensation to protein aggregation. 
So, and then, so that's why we want to get into the mechanism of it. And we see that there are two things that is possible for the uh, what how it highlights its potency. One is its transient interaction between par and protein, which I will show you more later. And then the other is called priming mechanism. It's one fast bind to par, somehow it's transformed, that it can also cause other fast protein that never seen par to be condensating. So, so again, we use our technology uh, together uh, to make some single molecular tools. So what we did here is that we can put PA or RNA into single dots, and then we flow into proteins in another label so that we know where they come together and how long they come together. Say if it's long life, you will see that the, the co-localization is uh, sustained or they just transient. So this happened for the RNA to the fast binding. You can see as you increase the concentration, there is more and more stable binding. But then for PAR, that is completely opposite. Even you increase the concentration, most of this is just transient binding. Somehow that the fast protein just touch the PAR protein and then it can go. So maybe this is a mechanism, like a catalyst, that only you need one molecule you can keep on touching different things and then you go away and then they can change them to condensate form. So this is kind of supported by another experiment based on our technology to conjugate the PAR onto a B. So in this case, if there is indeed a transient interaction, the interaction is not only around the PAR, but it will be also outside from the PAR B. And because they can form the interaction and then go on to other places to form the condensation. And that is indeed what uh, Kevin in, in Suraz lab observed. And then you can see that the PA and the uh, fast protein, you can see that they are not only on the beat, but also on the condensate, while the PA is only on the beat. And this in contrast to RNA. In that case, you can only see the protein is coated on the beat. So when, when um, Kevin was proposing this experiment. I would say that, hmm, that's interesting. That's a very good way to show it. I say, can you go one step further? Because now we have the PAR on the beat, can you centrifuge them, kind of make it into uh, the beat proportion? And then you can remove the beat. So now only the condensate in the solution phase. Now you can add onto another fuss that have never seen fuss, uh, seen PAR. And then you label with another color and see whether they can incorporate into it. And indeed, that is the case. That protein that never seen the PAR before can also join to this condensate once this first have seen PAR. And this leads us to a tentative model that first can behave two type of conformation. One is after the PAR touch it, may change the conformation. Once it uh, see um, uh, a naive first, then they will converge the naive first to a different conformation. And then as you go more and more, then they just form this condensates together. And this phenomenon is quite similar to prion. That we know that only very small amounts of abnormal folded protein can trigger a lot of cellular normal protein into a different conformation and cause a lot of aggregation and degeneracy. So we think that could it be the tip of the iceberg, particularly that a lot of genes uh, causative for uh, neurodegenerative like ALS, that is famous for the ice bucket challenge, or the FTD, the frontal temporal uh, dementia, that uh, recently Bruce Willis uh, mentioned that he, he got this uh, debilitative disease. When we look into that uh, genes that are causing this, there are 17 of them. Seven of them is found in our PAR binding protein. And then, and what I highlighted here is those that stars that is known to be aggregates in the disease tissues. So we go on to look into some of them that not even in the list. For example, our collaborative study look into the major uh, ALS and FTD gene, C9 of 72. They can make a dipeptide repeat. We show that PAR can, together with uh, Kerchang group, we show that, that the PAR can potently induce the condensation for poly-ADP ribose. And other groups have shown that 
uh, other AS protein like TDP43 can also cause condensation. And this is not just these two diseases, but also like Parkinson's disease. Alpha Sinekins, our colleague in the School of Medicine, the Dawson's group, has also shown that that accelerates. And if we think about like the genetic data, that's if there's uh, the enzyme that breaks down the ATP ribose is depleted, that we see that there's a lot of like uh, neurodegenerative disease, even in some that's not even have a name yet. And if you look into the animal model, they also see a lot of aggregates, not only in the nucleus, but also the cytoplasm. So as a summary, uh, we think that we may find a new trigger of protein condensation. Our tools reveal that in a non-biased manner, we see that there is enrichment of the um, this neurodegenerative disease protein. And that may be a new mechanism that power can transient interact and also prime it. And once it prime, it can also cause other protein to condensate. And power can also induce fuss in a length-specific manner, especially as I mentioned earlier, that the length or the concentration is increased in neurodegenerative disease. So moving forward, my lab focuses on three areas. One is condensate. What makes power so potent? What is the breath, the depth about it? And what is the neurological disease relevance? And then we continue to study the macrodomain bio, uh, biology and also developing inhibitors and developing new tools to do mechanistic studies. At the end, I want to go back to the tree that uh, um, uh, Dean McKenzie mentioned about it. I think we all want our health just as healthy as this fruit tree. And, and we know that as we are scientists here, we know that this all done to research. And this helped us to develop new practice and policy, and also a lot of drug development. And they are very good because they are also very tangible. Everyone can see it. But what I want to point out that for this fruit to grow really well, you have a deep roots beside. And that's the power of basic science and how we understand the molecular mechanism. And you can see that there's diverse impacts. There could be different types of foods, as I illustrated. Studying the pop biology, we can understand about cancer, virus infection, and neurodegeneration. And this is all made possible in our school here. We have the founding departments that really focus on the molecular basic science. We have people in and outside of the school. And more important, we have the power of the education here. That um, we have PhD student and uh, master student come together at different stage to move the project forward. And I also want to stretch myself in the future to, like, uh, to collaborate with other departments. Uh, one thing that I've always been thinking is like, not only discovery, new biology, drug developments, can we do surveillance through diagnostic? And this, for example, tocovirus is very common in, uh, in North Africa. And this is the hotbed of all the new viruses being developed. And in one of the competition that uh, our, our school is very good, that's encouraged the basic and applied science, we develop a team, hope to bring from molecules to society, and we hope to do it again in the future. So at the end, I want to thank uh, my team. Oh. This is uh, all of you make this possible for my lab member. And, and I really enjoying the time that we come to my office, sitting side by side. Scott always mentioned it because we always sit together and I corner them that they cannot leave the room. But, but in fact, I really like to talk about like, what did they find and then troubleshooting them. And then they have brilliant creativity that I don't have. Their expertise is amazing. Like the drug, <laughs> I have no idea how to make a script. So it's, it's great that to work together to discover something new. And of course, this also beyond our own lab. There are many people around the world, in the school, in the university have helped for collaborators that from developing new tools across disciplines to applying our tools to uncover novel biology. Thank you. All of them, I know some of you are in the Zoom. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining. For mentors as well, that's who are willing to listen. I mean, it's, there's a lot of troubles in academia as well. Share a walk, uh, read my grants, especially in the last minute. 
<laughs> and then provide critical feedback. Thank you. And also, uh, thank you, uh, Hopkins, as you hear that uh, a lot of things start from the internal resources to start to spark the project, follow up with federal agency, Pirate Foundation, and also our commercial partner, Deerfield, that for the possibility for me to turn my foundation discovery into drug therapeutics, this is something that I really want to do it. And I'm very grateful about it, uh, this opportunity. Lastly, the most important of all is uh, thank God for my family. Uh, my wife here, Chun Han, and uh, sharing all the up and downs, thick and thin, uh, as you could imagine in academia. Uh, my kids, Oliver, uh, Ellie in the car, <laughs> uh, Toby, Zoe, and also baby Ari. And then uh, my mom and dad, uh, parents-in-law, my sister, and all the siblings-in-law, and also a lot of family and friends. With their support, I don't need to worry about too much, but to explore the world, studying and moving around the group, focusing on the next scientific discovery. At the end, I want to um, dedicate this lecture to my dad, who unexpectedly passed away in uh, late uh, October in 2021. And the photos that I show you are actually all taken by him about Hong Kong. Um, uh, on this note, I just want to also thank everyone who are listening. I'm happy to take your questions. Um, but um, we're counting on you um, to prepare us for the next pandemic, and uh, you're just you're just doing amazing work in such a compassionate and collaborative way. So we couldn't ask for more. Thank you. So we'll open it up for questions. Um, yes. Yes, please. Yeah. And please, if you have a question online, uh, raise, your hand. raise your Zoom hand, and Becky will get you. Okay, a couple of quick questions. Uh, the fuss that's primed, is it denatured? Pa, when they uh, prime the fuss protein, are they denatured? Is the fuss protein denatured, yeah. We don't think that is the case because um, if you look into the dynamics of it, it's still moving in and out. It's not aggregated. Like if it is denatured, you will tend to be aggregated. The protein can still come in and out from the condensate. And then in a recent study that we just uh, accepted in PNAS, we showed that PA actually is a very rigid molecule in a physiological condition. But when protein bind, particular like FUS have a lot of positive charge, it can collapse the PA. But maybe it's because it's so stiff, when you collapse it, it changes the conformation. This is some idea that we're fooling around and let's see. But the primed fuss isn't necessarily bound to par. Right? No, once it's primed, it, it's no longer need to. So that's the first confirmation change. How does it occur? So that's what we are interested in. Second question was about the uh, your different length polymers of par. Did you look at branched? <laughs> that's the forever question. That uh, we we are we we are getting headway there. But as you know, like. Poly ADP ribose for defining is easy to do. We can do a purification like the HPLC, but for branch is take another level of chemistry purification to do it. So you haven't made it and tested it yet in that assay? Maybe it's share in the, <laughs> in the about, reception. <laughs> what about, and I'll stop after this one because we could go. What about uh, if it's bound to protein? Does that affect? Sorry? The if it's bound to protein in that assay where you have different lengths of PAR, if it's uh, attached to a protein, does it still? OK, so we haven't looked at, we, it would be important to do the experiment. One experiment that we have done is use path 5 a and then together with NAD and also the FUS together. And then see when we put the NAD, can we form the condensate? The answer is yes. And we can see there, there is some slight uh, modification, covalency conjugated to the, uh, the fast molecule. Okay. So that's possible. 
I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? That's how we get in. That's my first student, Casey yeah, yeah. Daniels, and that's that's how we get into my office and talk about science. <laughs> that's I'm being grilled. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about this? <laughs> that's very fun. Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Peter? Oh. Well, that was spectacular. Thanks, Peter. In terms of neurodegeneration, would you foresee these would have to be taken chronically from early in life, or could they reverse neurotangles and protein? So, so the question is, can the PA causing it to uh, form this aggregate, can it be reversed? Is that the question? So in our study, PA kind of formed the condensate. If we treat it with the patch, in that it does not, cannot break it down. So it supports the catalyst phenomenon that is like once it's formed, it cannot. But when we do like adding chaperone, all this can be resolved. So it's possible on that part. But what I'm thinking is that if we don't make it happen in the first phase, like a prevention strategy, can we lower the power level? That may minimize the chance of zero degeneration. Other questions? Any online? You're a quiet group. <laughs> yeah. What is that you're drinking? Uh, water, <laughs> hot water. <laughs> Hot water. Just trying to soothe myself. Great. Yeah, there's a question yeah, oh, online. There's one online. Yes. Um, I read it. Um, the question is, why are you using HeLa nucle nuclear extract for the PAR crosslink rather than the cell extract? That's a very good point. Why we do nuclear uh, extract to do the PAR binding, uh, the first census of PAR binding protein. The reason about it is that it's known that nucleus has a lot of action on the PAR. So for the first pass, we want to focus on that and then so that we get a very good signal. But uh, in the current iteration, we move beyond that. All right, I, th I think your daughters are getting anxious. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe this is a good time to break and um, everybody, oh, please. Thank you. And please, everybody, join us out um, uh, in the foyer there for a, a reception. Um, uh, thank you for those of you who have joined us uh, via Zoom. Unfortunately, we can't um, invite you virtually to the reception, but uh, thanks so very much for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Leung, for an outstanding presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.